Welcome back to the official Atari Games podcast. This is Jason here, joined once again by fellow producer Mark Perloff. Uh, we were also joined by a couple of members of Graphite. You've seen him before, Matt Rathel. And for the first time, we got Brad Austrin, the Hello. lead designer on Quamp 2, which we'll be talking about quite a bit this episode. That's what it's all about. Um, but before we get into that, let's just do a little bit of housekeeping here. You've heard this stuff before, and I'm going to keep talking about it because it's important. First of all, if you've been listening to the podcast, if you like it, I implore you, please review us on iTunes and Spotify. Five stars is preferred. Honesty is appreciated, but you know, wrap that up in a nice five star bow. That would be really nice. Um, Unless you really like it. If your honesty is uh, all positive stuff, that's also great too. Um, Quamp 2, we're about to talk about it. You can still wishlist it. This podcast will be dropping uh, right before the release date on February 20th. So if it's out, buy it. If it's not out, wishlist it. And if it's out, but you want to wait to get it, wish listed that that really helps out also coming soon lunar lander beyond you could wish list that and show our night dive friends some love by wish listing star wars dark forces which is coming very soon as well later this month lastly if you haven't done so yet join the atari discord gauge with various atari fans and drop any questions comments into the podcast channels i check in on those you guys are very quiet so please please Speak up, say something, and uh, and have fun in the Atari Discord. All those links to all those things are in the description. Um, so with that, let's get into it. Welcome, guys. Yeah, and happy to be here. Now, Thanks, Jason. We are going to jump in. We're going to talk about Quamp 2. But before that, got a warm-up question for you. Okay, oh now, Brad, we're going to drop your your Twitter link in the description so people can follow you and they could read the trials and tribulations of things that have happened over the last seven days with your, with your dog, which is a, it, it has a spoiler alert. It's got a happy ending. And that's yes. why I'm bringing up this question to the table, which is, I want to know from each of you, your favorite video game dog. Well, that's super easy. I don't even need to think about it. Well, then why don't you start, Brad? I will start uh, the obvious answer. These guys are, I think they're going to struggle. Yeah. Well, it's because they haven't played Ghost Trick, because the obvious answer is Missile from Ghost Trick. Come on. I mean, really, it's that's the easiest question you could have asked me. I'll tell you what, I will expand the question. If you're struggling with a specific video game dog, then I will expand it to any video game animal you would like. Um, What's the name of the duck hunt dog? I like that guy. Yeah, that's a good choice. Why not? (laughs) We'll take it. I like that guy. His name yeah. is Bernie. <laughs> Bernie. <laughs> is there an official lore around the duck hunt dog? Uh, that's, that's, that's I don't stuff. know. Duck. They're in Smash. Yeah. Like they got they got some stuff going on. Dog, also known as Laughing Dog. Yeah, Bernie. Yeah, that's, that's what I you said. You like that guy? <laughs> I always taunted you, but fair enough. I'm not going to. Hey, don't let me uh, knock your preferences. If that's your favorite dog, because that's the only one you could think of, that's fine. That's the uh, first one I thought of that I had a personal connection with. Yes. Uh, other dogs may pop into the conversation from time to time. Fair enough. Uh, Mark, you have one? You need a little bit more time or should I go? Um, no, I'm, I'm ready. Uh, go. I panicked and I was just like looking through my Steam library and the one that <laughs> popped to mind is uh, the pug from Spelunky. You, oh, you yeah. can save in every level. Um, so I don't, I can't say that that is like definitively my favorite, but I'm just glad I like, I found one. And then once you, ex- once you expand it to animal, I was like, that doesn't help me at all. I can't think of any oh. animals either period. So I'm glad I found a dog. So I'll say the pug from Spunky. Well, Brad, I, I will echo missile, the dog easily. Yes. One of the best uh, dogs oh, in video games. I was, you know, I, I would normally, I'm going to cheat because I am going to give a shout out to Koro Maru, the dog from persona three. But what I do want to talk about instead is Rapide, the dog from Tales of Vesperia, because he smokes a pipe and swings a sword. <laughs> and he is like your faithful companion throughout the game, and he's awesome. So Rapide from Tales of Vesperia, that gets my nod for best video game dog. And I'm sure he could beat the crap out of all the other dogs that anybody else would think of, because like I said, he wields a sword and he uh, smokes a pipe. <laughs> but Missile... <laughs> Doesn't Missile Ness can have crash. a dog at the beginning of, of Earthbound? I think Ness has a dog that comes with yeah. him that like sometimes attacks enemies, but then other times it's like your dog's yeah. like cowering in fear. And I'm like, oh. 
But there's another dog, Jason. I know more than one dog. And there's also names. one from Dragon Quest XI who joins you, just like the Earthbound. I don't remember his name. Um, I, don't, I don't remember the one for Dragon Quest XI. He was in the beginning with your childhood friend when you like travel up the mountain path or whatever. But does he, he doesn't fight, though. Right? He's not part I think of the he party. does. I think it was like Earthbound. Unless Look, I'm... Man, Dragon Quest XI is about it's a it's about a hundred hours, and it's about fifty hours too long, and I don't remember <laughs> anything that happens in the first twenty hours. It's a big one. Every single one of those. What about Bao from Breath of the Wild Two? Okay, that's a dog. <laughs> There's so many I questions I have with that statement. <laughs> Breath, of, what? Breath of the Wild Two. Is what oh, we're I, I, sorry, <gasps> wrong name. Breath of Fire. <laughs> Hey, edit that out, please. <laughs> I don't want any comments being like, hey, who's this idiot? Man, I'm oh. old. I've been in this industry 20 years this year. Uh, and it's uh, my brain. It's gone. I got too oh. many games, Jason. We don't, we don't uh, have the we Breath don't have of the Fire, too. Hey, you know, uh, Breath yeah. of Fire. That's that's good. Some people don't. See, you don't. redeemed yourself without the edit. Did I? Most people I don't, don't know so. Breath of Fire. Really? How could they not? Because when they're was young. The, tell me when the last Breath of Fire game came out. They did it on 95? mobile. Exactly. No. Do you there understand was... how long ago 1995 was? <laughs> it's like yesterday. To you. All right. Let's go to the uh, let, let's get moving to the topic of the show here. Let's talk about some Quamp 2. So now with the magic of uh, post-production, we are going to have some gameplay showing. So if you're listening on audio feed, nothing will change. It will be the exact same thing as you've always heard. Uh, but if you want to check it out and see what we're talking about and see some gameplay and you're like, man, I really want to get hyped or I want to know what's going on with Quamp 2. Let me see this firsthand. Well, then you want to click over to the YouTube channel and uh, and watch it because we'll have some gameplay there. And, you know, I, I think so Mark's going to play it and I guess we'll just start from the beginning. But I want to kick things off by throwing it to to Brad, really. Um and really, you know, setting the stage in all of our marketing, we're saying this is a sequel to to Pong. And in a way it is, but it's also a sequel to Quamp, which you can purchase right now on Steam. So Quamp, simple game, one button. You control a ball escaping a Pong game, and then you will follow its trials and tribulations. But I want to know, more so than creating a sequel to Pong, what was it like creating a sequel to Pong? Quamp, a somewhat, somewhat revered, I think, by those who played it, mm. uh, Indie Darling. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and a lot of my my work at Graphite is like, you know, I spend time either adapting like brands or, or building on on, you know, a previous like creator's mm. work. So really, my first step was to to understand not just what made Quamp special, but also kind of get into the head of the the original creator. So I would play the original, really make detailed notes and and you know appreciate it as a player. Like what do I what do I see that's special about this? You know, and when when I hit the conclusion, like how do I feel about it? And how can I kind of build off of that in a sequel that doesn't feel like it's, you know, kind of copy and pasting the same concept? How can I like take the the essence and the the heart of the game and and do something new? And um really that was that was the starting point, right? Like I kind of thought about like, you know, how can we put our own like vision towards towards a new idea that doesn't kind of like redo everything, but also, you know, kind of stand out on its own while feeling, you know, new, but not, you know, we're retread. So so here we are, you know, we, we got a we got a new idea and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's playable. You want to get into that? I that sure do want to get into that. So yeah, this is the beginning of the game, um, and the first quamp starts very similar. You know, you're trapped between two paddles, and this is kind of the dilemma of being a ball. And we once again kind of explore that concept with quamp two. And you'll see here, the ball's starting to kind of leak this like blue color. It's squared. And, yeah. you know, it's it's kind of trembling and you'll see something's about to happen. Yeah. So for the yeah, he kind of like does this whole flipping around motion and that kind of stuff. But the original the original quamp also is very limited in its color palette as well. 
Right. Yeah. And one of the big things that we decided to do with this was have like a specific color to kind of guide and, and set this one apart. So Quam 2, you'll find a lot of blue. And um, that kind of ties into to the new story, the new themes. And you'll see that the ball is now circle. So, you know, it's it's a minimalist story. So it's it's up for interpretation about about what happened, but something makes it transform. And now you kind of see like, okay, the paddle on the right is blue. That's interesting. I wonder what I can do, you know, with that. And that's kind of where the new additional button comes into play with Quant 2. Yeah. Now, first we had a, um, I think there was a little bit of a, we, we had an interesting discussion early on because the whole point, I think the biggest mechanic you added was this dash this charging mechanic, right? And I think one of the big questions was about whether or not that's on a second button or it's all in one button. Like, as you tap, <laughs> the original game was just you just tap and then that would change your direction as you're going diagonally, either you're going up or down. Right. And, and I remember we talked about whether or not, like, well, how can we how can we make it another button? It's Quomp. Quomp only has one button. And then I think someone was like, yeah, well, it's Quomp two buttons. There you yeah, go. <laughs> Quomp two buttons. Yeah, it was it was a challenge, you know, at first. Like the initial design was like you would have to push and then hold the direction change button. So it was on one button. And, you know, that had like nuance and mastery in its own right. Um, but we kind of found like, adding that second button really allows the player to more comfortably adapt and react in a, in a timely manner. So we ended up going for the the two button solution. And I think, you know, it's, it's still simple. Like totally. you couldn't play it with your one button, you know, controller, but, but yeah, you know, I think it's, it's the best result. Yeah. When you're uh when you're making a game like this, when you're making a game that's designed to be so simple, what are the biggest challenges in actually creating like, you know, you got one button or two in this case, and it's meant to be simple, accessible, approachable. And but you have to keep that compelling for the for the duration of a multi hour experience. What are the biggest challenges that you encounter? In that? Good question. Um, Thank you. And <laughs> and really like. You know, the button limitation wasn't too much on my mind. I think like in terms of like simplicity and minimalism, the biggest challenge was the fact that like the ball keeps moving, right? Like it has its course. You have a very limited amount of like movement to kind of work with. So there were a lot of times like making puzzles where it's like you have to arrange solutions and kind of set up different levels of challenge. But then you know, there's there's only a few ways to get through and like there might be one where you can just slink right by, you know, because it's it's not like a traditional platformer where you have more more movement controls or you can restrict some of that. So so, you know, the challenge kind of came into to that more so than like the the limited buttons, I would say. Yeah. How did you decide where to place it? So we just saw Mark picked up one of the collectibles, right? The hidden collectibles. Um mm -hmm. How did you decide how mean to be when placing those collectibles? So the collectibles are interesting because when I kind of arranged like our, our design Bible and like, you know, came up with like the marching orders for like how we would do levels and stuff, we really set up like different tracks for like the different kinds of players. So like there's the normal player who just kind of does whatever. They might stumble into like collectibles, but they're not really going for them. You've got like your speed runners and of course your completionists. And we really designed like each room to kind of account for it. So sometimes you'll find that like the collectibles might be relatively easy for like a normal like path player, but like a speed runner might have more trouble because like, oh, it, it takes a long time to get this, you know, the safest way, but but you might have to do something a little more daring and bold, you know, to shave the the 10 seconds or so, you know, that, that would be required there. So, so that's kind of the, the main thinking, but in terms of like, you know, standard difficulty, I tried not to be too cruel. We kind of like, we test some of the, the skills and abilities that we, we teach, you know, in that linear order, like as you're watching here, you can see, we kind of introduce like obstacles kind of one by one. And we usually, do collectibles that require some challenge either from like the previous thing we kind of taught or something that's 
kind of coming up. So, so maybe like players who are very skilled could, could get a, a hard collectible on their first playthrough, but, but you know, they wouldn't know how to necessarily master something until later. So there's some of that like replayability Oops. element there as well. Totally. Mark on that point, I want to know what was the thing that you were like, that, that actually broke you. Like what was the most frustrating thing that Brad put in the game? You're like, why did you do this to me? I think some of the later levels where you're in <clears throat> different zones where you can't um, change your direction or you can't charge. Uh, those ones are, can get very, very tricky. Uh, so I think, yeah, that that's, that's probably it, but it, it's always like a nice, it's like a, there's definitely there are moments of frustration, but it's like a it's a it's a good frustration that feels especially satisfying once you have sort of puzzled it out. Um, oh, yeah. But yeah, uh, uh, deeper in the game right now, I'm kind of like just zoning out through these first the uh, first levels. But deeper in the game, it gets there's there's certainly a, a jump in difficulty. This is this is actually a cool example of like one of those puzzle rooms where there's like there's a few different ways it can be done. I mean, there's one, I'm going to say correct way, mm-hmm. but it is, mm-hmm. it, it does force you to really think about the mechanics more so than you have to previously. And thinking about the direction you're going totally at all times, like yeah. clearly Mark's done this a few times. So he was able to breeze through it. But mm-hmm. that is like, that room is interesting. And it is one of the first times that you actually really push a player to truly understand like how the mechanics of the game work and what yeah. directions you actually have yeah. control over. Exactly. And like you might have noticed like the um like those whirlpool looking things. I like to call them magnets, but they let you like dock safely for a while as long as you want and you can release yourself when you're ready. And yep. we, we put, you know, crutches like that for like the normal player. You might be able to like stop and think. But of course, you know, a speedrunner is not going to want to do that too long. And that's kind of how like the the difficulty track thing kind of works. Like there's really never like one forced way to solve a room. There's always a, a variety of ways to approach. And that was very much the intent with the the design on a per room basis. Yeah. yeah. And we did some of that with like checkpoint positioning uh, also. So it's like if we if there's something that we think the player might struggle with. And we did this with run and jump and with Combinera. So like learning from previous, you know, collaborations with, with you and your team, um, you know, making sure that we could, you know, limit the, at least the, the replay frustration. If a player did run against something that they struggled uh, against, you know, they, they respawn quickly, they get to, to try the problem area uh, quickly and, and then move on. So yeah, you, you like problems. stop reading my notes. I actually was going to ask you that question, <laughs> which is like some of the, some of the key learnings, because I think there is a, there's a nice progression of mm-hmm. the games that you guys have done. Not, you know, uh, Roller Coaster Tycoon Adventures Deluxe, notwithstanding, but from Common Era to Mr. Run and Jump and now to Quamp 2. Quamp. Yeah. Like you can draw a pretty clear line. Like I remember the way that this game actually came to fruition was that, you know, Wade acquired Quamp mm-hmm. with the intention of doing Quamp 2. And I think. Mr. Run Jump was probably already in production at that point, very right. early on. And he was the one who said, oh, Graphite would do a great job of, uh, of Quant 2. And next thing you know, like, we, were, we were off to the races. It was, it was super. Yeah, it was, it was great. And we'd been you know working on it for a while. But like we, if I look back at these three games, Combinera wasn't very like reflex heavy, but it was a heavy on the brain melting, like puzzling. Like you couldn't mm-hmm. accidentally get the right solution in that one run and jump kind of adds a lot of reflex difficulty, right? So it's like, you know how to get to the end and you know the solution, get to the right. But like the reflexes get tested and Quamp kind of does a little bit of both. Like it's not painful, painful on the reflexes and it's not painful, painful on the brain either. So it is kind of a blend of the two things we've gotten really good at of these little puzzly (coughs) platforming bits and, you know, good old fashioned, real snappy controller, you know, reflex style gameplay. So um, hopefully fans see that and appreciate it because they've loved those last two games and hopefully they give this one a try as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We yeah. need to do some serious edits to my gameplay here to make me nope. look. <laughs> no, I think it's, uh, I was totally, uh, all right. I, was, I totally threw that. That was crazy. Pers- yeah. Perseverance. Yeah. But it's funny that you're talking about that as we were doing challenges. Yeah. yeah. You're like, so, it's not that hard. It's like, you know, it just tickles your brain a little bit. I'm like dying over and over and over. 
that, that's, that's that's yeah. user error. That's, that's not yeah, true. and uh, you know my philosophy, like the game's themes are about moving forward, right? And the ball is always moving forward, and that that's kind of the the design philosophy as well. Like you know, find your way forward. There's no one way to do it. Like keep experimenting, keep trying, keep going, and that's very much something that that meshes with the story we're trying to tell here as well. That's again, man, you are just walking right into the questions <laughs> and I Psychic. love it. And that is storytelling in this game because yeah, this tells a story, right? We don't mm-hmm. want to give spoilers of course, but how do you tell a story and how did you, how, what was your approach in trying to tell a story in Quamp 2? And communicating that story, you know, you're, there's obviously no cutscenes. Well, let's say there's no uh, cutscenes, right? There's, eh, yeah, but I, I get what you mean. Yeah, there's, yeah. You know, it's wordless. I guess is what you're trying to say. You know, there's yes. no no dialogue. Um, True. We and really, we didn't do a Thomas is alone thing with a no, narrator. <laughs> no, nothing like that. So, uh, in in cases like this, you know, in a game what have you got as tools you know you've got you've got your gameplay you've got your your toolkit for the player and i considered all the actions that were you know available in in the first quamp and then our dash as well you know and i considered all of that and then like the the shape of the circle in this one is is also a very important thing like the change and you'll notice like there's circles in the obstacles there's that color is you know playing an important factor And the nature of like minimalism is like, I don't want to force one way of looking at this on people either. So we, we have like general like pillars in here for people to kind of think about. And the conclusion you make is kind of up to you. So as you play through the game, as you see how obstacles work and how things develop and, you know, ultimately concludes, I think that you'll, you'll come to some kind of conclusion. It might be kind of close to, to what I imagined, you know, as a creator, because um, when you're working with a team, it's kind of different versus like when a solo dev just kind of does their thing, you know, like I had to communicate my vision of the story to to team members to make sure there was there was harmony so that, you know, elements, they fit together, right? Because because otherwise it, it might not be as clear to, to figure out what it all means. For yeah. sure. Mark just Mark just bailed on trying to get that. <laughs> that. I didn't I'm not even know all the way back. Come that on. one's that one's a that one's a tough one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mark's yeah. If you're if you're not watching that, like that that's a fun one because immediately at the start of the level, you're you see the collectible and it's all spikes all the way, and the only way to get it is to go backwards, and then you got to go back again to to finish the level. It's rude. Yeah, yes. I mean, I've I've done it, <laughs> but I think oh, you no know, one's saying you haven't done it. No, I'm sure no. you've done it. We know you can do it. But I, yeah. I feel like you know, I'm just like, if you want to do that, go all the way back. Like respect. But yep, yeah, yep. I'm moving and on. <laughs> kind of going back to like the tracks I talked about, like a speedrunner, they would never. They would never, right? Like they'd, right. Oh. they'd have to go back and forth, but, but yeah, you know that's kind of the nature of of things. You kind of have to weigh your options. Yeah, timing is pretty good here. You know, Mark Mark is now entering the the first boss. Um, so how how did you approach boss designs in this? So the first Quamp had bosses. Um, they were all basically pretty similar. You know, if you played the first one, they were the. Sorry, that was impressive. I thought that was the first try. That was pretty. Book. That's yeah, pretty that's, smooth. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You know, they'll uh, screw it up now, thanks. but you did a really good there job. Yeah. Oh, now you're just showing up. Collectible. Way to go, Mark. Thank you yeah, guys. But, uh, but yeah, you know, the first one, they were all all paddles. Like, you had different behavior per paddle fight. Um, and this one, I, I really wanted to ramp it up. So you'll notice this one is a paddle, kind of paying homage to the, to the first game. But past this point, like, the game will kind of develop into its own thing and kind of playing off of what like the the original quamp did i'm not going to spoil bosses of course unless we maybe get to them i don't know but but uh you know we now that quamp is under the the atari name you know it gave me an opportunity to pay a little homage to to some of their other properties so so some bosses might kind of explore you know other atari games that had a ball and kind of you know playfully build off of that um and really like the boss fights kind of use the the new mechanics a lot. So you'll, you'll be dashing a lot to, to beat them and, and yeah. Yeah. 
the uh the drag shout out to the dragon boss in particular because that thing is really cool i know that's taking inspiration from uh warlords so yeah that was yep. warlords that's a yep. that's a very cool one another fun exercise i you know I, early on i was i was privy to a bunch of these conversations um and i remember that was one of the earlier discussions you know matt brought up the point earlier about checkpoint placement sure and i think fairness and that and that kind of thing is a perfect example of where you really need to look at the balance of fun to frustration yeah and how much time are you putting in so it's like yeah mark was in that room before where it was Ex- exceedingly difficult, more difficult than other ones, but he was trying over and over again, but never too far removed from the point of challenge. Yeah. And that, and that's when these games are at their best. Like e- even a game, like most recently I'd point to a game like lies of P, which is obviously a radically different game from this, from a gameplay perspective, but you were never too far from that point of extreme difficulty. And that's what kept you coming back and let you do that. All right, just one more. I can do it next time. I can do it next time. Sure. I can do it next time. Yeah. You're only talking like a few seconds of time. It's great. Exactly. And I know when I, I played the first Quamp, I had a lot of trouble with the boss fights in particular. Because that mm-hmm. one, it's like, you know, you could hit it twice and then die. And then you have to start over, which is unfortunate. But uh, my philosophy, yeah, in this one is is like you said, you know, we wanted to make sure that they were fair. And there was never that long, like, chain of of time where it's like you got it down pretty low you die and you have to redo it you know so like the warlords boss for example we actually have a checkpoint that you can kind of get whenever you're you're ready to in that one Mm -hmm. so you can kind of weigh your options um and then yeah some of the other fights you know like they have checkpoints like midway through or or at certain times where there could be a pinch point so so it should be forgiving yeah totally Man, I think uh, any what tips can you give to someone who's going into Quamp Two? Uh, a layman, let's say, not necessarily someone who's speed running, but someone who's going in and they're like, "Man, what should I expect? What do I need to be aware of? How do you make sure? How do I not get frustrated?" I've got three good tips. The first Perfect. tip is if you are feeling completely helpless, you can pause the game and turn invincibility on. You can do that whenever you want. Oh. That's the uh, Matt Stevens mode. <laughs> <laughs> yes, our producer certainly needed that. <laughs> I think there's definitely two Matts on the team that benefit yes. from that mode. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's the first thing. And if, if they're willing to fold with that, you know, whatever. But if you want to genuinely, you know, get good at the game without needing that feature, then I would recommend using the dash and kind of learning some of the nuances to it. So, for example... When you're first charging your dash, it actually slows down your ball, which can help you kind of, you know, work around specific areas or or kind of, you know, there's advanced maneuvers to kind of time some of that slowness. And that could be good, almost like when you're like drifting or something in a in a racing game. You know, there's those times where you need that little bit of slowness to to master that boost. Um, So so I would pay attention to that. And then my last tip is is if you rebound a wall, you can actually complete a charge instantly. So this is kind of an advanced maneuver. So you can either tap right when you hit a wall, or you can tap and hold, but it'll fully charge you to max instantly. And I recommend using that a lot. I know when I kind of go through the challenge rooms, that's something I do, but but I think it's worth mastering. I'd also add just uh, as a general tip is to just relax when you're playing it like oh yes when i uh when we were when we were showing this at uh, demoing at you know like comic-con and stuff like that um i think people as they were learning how to play they would sort of be a bit frantic mm-hmm. like trying to like yeah. oh where, where, am I, where am i going like, what do i have to do and the game as you can see it moves at its own pace which is pretty deliberate and you usually have time to, to think about like what it is that you need to do and i think if you can kind of like take a breath as you're playing and sort of slow yourself down a bit, I think you end up playing much, much better um, because you do usually have time to figure out what your next move is. Whereas if you're just kind of like rushing in and sort of frantically trying to dodge out of the way, a lot of the times you're going to go head first into an obstacle. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And uh, this, that room you just went through has a, another interesting little design nuance. I, 
I guess I invented, I call it onion design. I don't know if this is a real thing, but what onion design is, what I've kind of taught the junior designers is like something that can, can reappear in like the same level, but in a different context. So you'll see the door you opened on the left makes that ball, you know, the lava shooter, it like recontextualizes that, that challenge. So it's kind of a, you know, it's like a stylized version of like design, like reusing different elements in a different way as you like progress. And it's, you know, it's a little thing that makes it feel, feel nice and, and polished. And for people who are designers or studying design, it might be like, a, Oh, you know, that's cool that you, you found a way to use things in, you know, multiple contexts. So that was something else we kind of did. I would, I would call it foreboding. Uh, oh man, what was I just going to say? Um, Oh man, what was it? Oh man, I had the word, and it was alliteration too. It was great. Boating. Um, Funyuns? No, 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 no. <laughs> it's like uh, that's what I was gonna say. Yeah. Showing what it's gonna be like, um, like a forecast. Foreshadowing. 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 That's what it is. For, for, yeah. Foreboding. Foreshadowing. Because foreboding, foreshadowing. you're often going through levels, and you're like, okay, I'm bouncing off these walls, and there's spikes. I know those spikes are gonna are gonna bite me in the ass later. Yeah, for totally. sure. So that's yeah. Uh, like that happens earlier on. Yeah, it's it's very cool the way you do it. Even even that thing we were talking about before with that obstacle. It's like you can have that optional uh, evolution of the level where, hey, you want to come back through all this stuff? You can, you know, totally. you want to get that little droplet. You can do it. Yep. And for any anyone who's learning design, who's listening to this and like, what the heck is onion design even supposed to mean? I call it onion because it's like it has layers, right? So there's like different layers to a the purpose of something. So an obstacle, you know, it would have different layers if it has different contexts. So that's, that's the thought process. Very cool. Matt, what about you? You got any, you got any tips that you could, uh, you know what else has layers? Shruggers. (laughs) Uh, no, I I think, I think Brad nailed it. I'll also say that like Brad is a designer, the team, uh, as a group, um, nothing really in the game is an accident. So I think you'll, you'll be able to get a sense of their own design sensibilities as you play it. And again, without words, start to kind of see, um, see, see and make proje- uh, predictions about the design. And um, I think just with spending more time with it, it just gets players um, more into this, uh, this quamp verse. So, yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, uh, everything kind of went through, because I kind of established like the themes and the storytelling, everything went through like my review. So like everything kind of passes that like story consistency thing, because yeah. in a minimalist game, like it's, it's fair game to, to think about any element. So we had to be really careful about, you know, tiles, obstacle designs, boss designs and, and whatnot. Yeah. yeah. Well, mm-hmm. very cool. And that's a good place to end the, uh, the stream, the, uh, the let's play because, that that level is super satisfying. If you're not watching, it's a level where you are constantly pushing this one block through the entire level and clearing pathways for it. It it really does a great job of culminating in everything you know up until that point. Yeah. So yeah, really really nicely done on that. So and well done, Mark. Uh, fantastic. Yeah, I have to stop. Yeah, I was having so much fun. I was, uh, I was yeah, really that's cruising. A, that's a struggle. Good. Yeah, you're killing it. So let's end let's end here as we uh, as we always do and just talk about what we're playing. Um anybody uh Mark, why don't you go first? Oh man. I I we you know, we were just on a, this podcast recently talking about uh you know, um another project and I haven't played anything that interesting since then. So I don't want to repeat myself. So can I give a, a TV show recommendation? Yeah, sure, that's fine. Okay. It'll be uh I'll I'll allow it. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> nice. uh, so, an animated show on Netflix called Blue Eye Samurai. Oh, uh, yeah. You mm. guys have seen this? It rules. No. It's, um, I guess it's an anime. I think it's made in, 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 in the States, I think. Um, but it's set in feudal Japan. <clears throat> and uh, the main character is uh, uh, the Blue Eye Samurai, who is a sort of half breed, who is uh, the father is. A white man and the woman, the mother of Japanese and they're sort of an outcast from society. And it's about their sort of quest for revenge. So it sort of follows a pretty, I guess, kind of standard um, overarching plot. But the writing is amazing. The animation is incredible. The like, I don't know what you would call it because in it, like fight choreography, which is just, you know, 
it's all just animation, but it's sure. like incredibly well done. It's also super brutal and bloody. Um, so definitely like fully adult, um, very mature in its themes and also just in its sort of violence and sex. Um, but it's so cool. So I like, I can't recommend it highly enough. So blue eye samurai. Mark's recommending some adult anime. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> Matt. <laughs> uh, no, no adult anime recommendations right now, but you have a new game. Um, I, uh, I've been playing through uh, Prince of Persia, the lost crown. Um, nice. I've always been a Prince of Persia fan. Um, I saw it at PAX actually, when we were there with you guys looking at quamp and run and jump and everything. And um, I thought it was, it's, you know, it's it's a great franchise, but I thought it was kind of bold, and I, I hope that Nintendo taking a chance on like Metroid Dread, and then now you know Ubisoft doing that with Prince of Persia. Uh, it's great to see more high production, you know, bigger production uh, Metroidvanias out there. Um, I love those types of games. Um, I love that kind of uh, location and the, the overall look and feel of it. And um, yeah, so that's that's kind of the the new one right now. Yeah, I actually just recently played through that as well. This is unlike Mark. I come over prepared. I have multiple games. I, I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> the roll well, and that was that was going to be my first choice, but I got a, I got a backup lined up, ready to go. But that game is like near perfect. I I can second this and highly recommend it. It is phenomenal. It's great to hear. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I've just I've just uh, only kind of started in with it, but. Um, yeah, no. So and honestly, I finished the other game that I talked about last time. So for the for the purposes of shameless self promotion of uh, of all of us here, the there are challenges in that game that are that you can find very similarly in Mister Run and Jump because hmm. yeah. there's a lot of these uh, platforming challenges with one hit kills where you're constantly forced to right. you know, do these tight navigation platforming challenges. And let me tell yeah. you something: if you like that. And you want more of it? Play Mr. Run and Jump. You will not be disappointed. And I'm not saying that like just to shill. I'm saying it partly to shill, but mostly because it's true. So there you go. Um, yeah, and our, our minds have clearly been on platforming for a little bit with Run and Jump. Um, so to see you know see that show up, um, you know, I like platformers. I like them to be successful. Yeah. I like people to and developers and designers to to keep giving classic genres uh, kind of new looks. And um, so it's exciting to see. Yeah. Game's fantastic. Great choice. Mm -hmm. Brad. I feel like I'm going to steal your idea, but I'm going to say it anyway. Maybe you haven't played it, but I'm playing another code recollection, which is the. <laughs> no, nobody's playing that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I am. It's a it's a remake of the the another code series. I don't know how familiar people are. There was a DS and a Wii game. Um, oh, that's the that's the Nintendo game, right? The uh, yeah, it's made by the, the Hotel Dusk yeah. people. Yeah, yes. Yep. Nope, never played the original. Never played, played the original. One. Yeah, so I'm playing it. I'm on the first one's remake right now, but so far I'm I'm really impressed. You know, like right. the the original is such a, a DS game. You know, it has so many DS console gimmicks. Like there's puzzles that use the touch screen, of course. There's even puzzles that use like the sleep mode. Like you have to actually close your DS, which was really cool. And I was worried going into it, like, how the heck are they going to do this? And it turns out they basically reinvented, like, a lot of the game. You know, it's, it's a, a legit, like, remake. And they rethought, like, puzzles and situations and scenarios. And a lot of, like, the, the gimmicks and puzzles use, like, new technology, you know, post-DS stuff. So you've got, like, puzzles using analog sticks, puzzles using gyro. And you can tell, like, they're really passionate. And they put a lot of work, like, into recreating this for like the new generation. So, so I really admire what they've done so far and, and I'm pretty pleased with it. You know, it's not perfect. There's a couple things I'm not huge on. Some of the charming points from the original game are like gone questionably. I don't know why, but there's like new charming points kind of in its place. So it kind of evens out, but, but yeah, I recommend it. If you, if you like adventure games. Nice. It's maybe on the list. If Do I need, if I, if I ever stop playing my choice, which is oh. like a dragon in oh. oh this is uh this came out so this this recording is actually not going to go live until february 16th um so but as of this recording is it is january 31st i started playing this game on the 26th and I have already put in about 16 hours into this game. 
uh, most of which are were over the weekend. And I'm a huge Yakuza fan. And this is just more, it's just like, oh, I'm back and hanging out with some old friends. And the moment they, they introduce a new character with Like a Dragon, with this guy Ichiban Kasuga, and that guy is awesome. So are his gang of friends, and now he's got new friends, some old friends. He's in Hawaii. He's getting up to some shenanigans. And man, is this game awesome. If you like JRPGs starring a bunch of uh, brooding Japanese men and women, then, man, have I got the game for you. <laughs> like a Dragon, Infinite Wealth. And it is as serious as, as, as it is goofy. I've always described the series as a, as a um, soap opera. And that's most definitely what it is when it comes to its storytelling. But imagine the most melodrama, dark soap opera, mafia tale. And then all of that is padded by the goofiest side quests. And <laughs> even even the battles of this game, like you have a class where you are a surfer and you or there's another one where you're like a, you're like a dancer and you're like and your weapon are maracas. I mean, I, I just got this uh, like a jet powered surfboard for the uh for the surfer class like this is the kind of weird <laughs> stuff and then next thing you know you're getting you're you're fighting this like head of this mafia gang that's run by danny treo like this is the kind of crazy stuff that happens all in the same game and then there's an animal crossing mini game and uh yeah like a dragon infinite wealth fantastic game i'll probably be playing this throughout the entire month of february but i'll be sure to have something new for the for the next podcast so yeah um that's so something. Just, can i add one actual game recommendation because i feel please when, when we when i ended last time you said <laughs> okay mark is recommending adult anime that like <laughs> is it the show's really game? good and it, uh, but uh it that just didn't sit, sit right with me I apologize. Uh, so there's a game that i started playing that i'm excited to talk about if I am, if I'm ever allowed back on the podcast, we'll see, um, we'll see if you uh, want to come back after I said that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's called Stasis Bone Totem, which oh, is tell me a, about this. A, I don't know what this it is. It came out last year. Uh, it's a modern uh, point and click adventure game that's set on mm. like a derelict, like, um, like out at sea derelict like ship. I'm, I've yeah. just started, but it's, it's seems really interesting. It's supposed to have, it already does. And I can, I can kind of see where it's maybe starting ahead in like kind of a Soma kind of vibe or a sure. dead space sort of thing. Um, so uh, it's super cool so far, but I don't have a lot to say about it aside from um, I'm excited to, to, to dive yeah, in. This looks, so. this looks nice. really cool. What was yeah, that? I saw other... it on some list. It was someone, I think I saw it on Twitter. I don't know. I, I can't remember who, but it was someone was like, here are some like overlooked indie darlings from the last year, indie gems, but they were like actually overlooked, you know? Um, yeah. So uh, it was from some, some list there um, that, yeah, I'm, it's a sequel, I guess, to a game called Stasis that I'm not familiar with, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm excited to, to dive in. Yeah. It reminds me of, oh man, there was that horror, I, that other isometric horror game that came to Game Pass as well. And it was also it also had like those kind of resident evil vibes where it kind of it took that isometric perspective but it was also pretty uh pretty dark as well i don't remember the name of it hmm. which is great it's always a good thing to to know is um anyway look we're we're at the end here so <laughs> so you'll just have to look that up based on the clues i've given you and maybe you'll figure it out clearly i forgot how i forgot the word um, foreshadowing so that's where i'm at anyway matt thank you for joining Jason, where thanks for having me. Where can people find you? Uh, you can find me on all of the social medias, either at Graphite Lab, if you want to follow the studio. Uh, I am at Raytheo Show, uh, which uh, is, yeah, personal Twitters and personal uh, social medias. Good stuff. Brad, where can people find you? Uh, so I'm on Twitter. I'm going to call it Twitter. Sorry, I'm not calling it the other thing. Uh, and me Boss neither. 528 <laughs> is my at, and... I also own a preservation account, and that's called Game Vacanti, and that is on Twitter, Tumblr, YouTube, archive.org, really like everywhere. So so I'm all around, but Bost528 or Game Vacanti, you can, you can find me at either. Game Vacanti had a huge breakout tweet last <laughs> year posting a game that I've never heard of, and yeah. I like to, and this, this sounds weird, but like, 
I worked at GameStop at a time during the like Xbox 360, PS3 era and um, and Wii era. So I was under the opinion that if a game existed, I at least know what it is by look. And that was one that I've never seen ever. And it was like this RPG with an incredible art style. And it's apparently really bad. Yeah. And I even got Yuzo Koshiro, famous game composer, to reply to that. And I think, God, what did he say? He said like, ugh, or something. <laughs> and, and it was going viral. People were like, oh my God, that's hilarious. And it, yeah, it, it went viral. So yes, that was me. Yeah. How do you spell the name of that, of your account? So it's Game Vacanti. So it's just game. And then V E C A N T I. Cool. There you go. Um, I feel like I'm still, by the way, looking to see if I could find what the name of this game is that I that I was trying to find the name of, but I'm really like I can tell you the PS3 game if if listeners are curious. No, no, I'm still trying to find the the horror game. (laughs) I'm going to say it anyway. It's called Time and Eternity, the one I was talking about that Yuzo Koshiro commented on. Yeah. Cool. Good stuff. Mark, I don't know the answer, but where can people find you? I mean, we went over this last time. I'm, you know, in my house in New Jersey. That's it. There you go. Wandering the streets of New Jersey. There you go. Uh, Cool. So then that comes to me. You can find me at uh, Jays of Doom on Twitter slash X. Some, pe- some people want to call it X. So I just got to Otherwise, they're going to be very confused. What's Twitter? You know, so you got to say J- at Jays of Doom. You can follow me there. Uh, once again, you can look forward to Quamp 2 coming out February 20th. And that will be on Atari VCS, Switch, Xbox One, Xbox Series X, PS4, PS5, PC via Epic and Steam. I think I got everything. Runs great on Steam Deck, by the way. Mm-hmm. Test of that. Really great portable game. Really great pick up and play. Play a level or two. Put it away. Won't do much damage to your battery life. Wherever you play it, Quam 2 is going to be a good one. So wishlist it or buy it or wishlist it, then buy it and then buy it for a friend. Spread the word. Quamp 2 is about to take over the world. And that's it. We are at the end. Thank you, everybody, for joining. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.